football, the world's most captivating sport, has impacted millions of lives and has created such a range of emotions to many over the decades, bringing people and communities together and also tearing them apart. Football carves a pathway of many lives and is the most recognised sport across the globe. With the English claiming it is their own sport, many things have intertwined with the English game. Many people say that the 70s and 80s were the peak of English football, as the biggest teams in England such as Liverpool and Manchester United were also reigning across Europe. When fans returned back to England after following their clubs around Europe, they brought back clothes in different clothing styles with them. This marked the birth of the football casual subculture. time, the casual culture within the UK has changed rapidly and many new things can be seen in today's style of football casual. To get an insight on what it was like to grow up with the birth and rise of the subculture, I spoke to Rob Irving who is a lifelong Port Vale fan to gain an understanding on what growing up through such times was like. So I think I was probably about four or five and uh, used to go to my grandparents every weekend. Um, my grandpa was a big um, sports fan and we'd sit and watch uh, Grandstand all day, which was the TV programme at the time on a Saturday afternoon. And we'd watch the reports of games coming in. Um, and he'd teach me about different grounds and the nicknames of different teams and things. And uh, that was when I first became aware of football being a big influence in my life. And, the Liverpool team at the time was the, the dominant force. They, they won the European Cup and the league title on a number of occasions. I asked my mum and dad for um, a football shirt for Christmas. I think it would have been around about 1980. And um, I got given the Liverpool shirt with the uh, classic big white V and Hitachi on the front and the liver bird. And uh, I thought it was the bee's knee. It was the best thing I, I could have had. I remember going up to see my grandpa and uh, being really excited about showing him this Liverpool shirt and uh, got up there and said, Grandad, Grandad, look at my new uh, my new shirt. And the first thing he said was, well, you can get that off for starters. He says, well, get you a proper football shirt. Uh, and two weeks later, it was my birthday. And for my birthday, he got me a, a Vail shirt. Um, and then um, not long after that, I started going up with, with my grandpa and my uncle Harold and we, we'd come up to the Vale and stand on the paddock. Um, and, uh, and that's how I got, uh, got into being a Vale fan. I suppose that was probably when I was in my teens, um, early, early teens, 13, 14. I was started to be able to come to the ground myself rather than have somebody take me. So um, I come up and stand on the paddock at the, where the paddock meets the, the Hamill Road end. And um, I'd stand with the, with the older lads and I'd noticed that they were all wearing um, different things. They weren't wearing football shirts. Um, I, the first thing I noticed was the shoes. They were all wearing really bright coloured Adidas shoes, Puma shoes, and uh, bright coloured tracky tops, um, Sergio, Sergio Tagini and Fila and brands like that. And uh, you became aware that they were dressing differently from uh, others. Yeah, it was probably um, around that time. It was it was all about the shoes to begin with, because that was the only thing that I could probably get my hands on in the forward. And uh, I remember getting my first pair of Adidas shoes and being really pleased. And um, Puma was the big brand as well at the time, and everybody was wearing either Trim Trabs or um, Puma Vlas or Californias. And um, I remember getting my first pair and thinking, "Wow, this is it! I'm the bee's knees now." Really, uh, 
maybe we thought it was something that arrived with a, with a pair of decent trainers instead of Tesco two stripes. Um, it was probably a bit later than that when I was in my late teens that I was starting to be able to afford um, the branded clothes, the tops and the, and the shirts and things. And uh, at that time it had moved on a little bit and it was uh, Henry Lloyd and Paul Smith and brands like that. I think um, in, the, in the 80s, the, the music scene um, moved with the, the dominant forces in football. I think a lot of the, the, the music that was being listened to in the, in the mid 80s when Liverpool were dominant was the, the Liverpool music scene, the Echo and the Bunnymen, Teardrop Explodes, bands like that, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. There was a, a big Liverpool culture, Pete Wiley would be another one. Um, and then as you moved into the 90s, um, Manchester United became the dominant force in English football and, and the music scene moved on to Manchester with um, you know, Oasis and, and bands like that, the Charlatans and James. Um, but there was always a connection all went hand in hand. I think as you got older, um, you moved on from just being clones and it was more about music came into it. You know, you, you finish work on a, on a Friday night and the anticipation of build for, for Saturday. Um, meeting, your, meeting your mates at the pool for a drink, the music will be on. You'd be going, you know, if you're going away, it'd be travelling up to the ground, parking up, getting out, seeing everybody else, walking to that ground and then entering the away end. It, was, you know, it could be packed on one occasion, depending on who you were playing. It could be virtually empty, there could just be a handful of them, but it was that like whole vibe of the excitement around Saturday afternoon. Getting the three points and the win, and the goals going in.